you know the story, so, uh, so I've, got, you know, I've got to be uh, kind of true to the script on this one. So, uh, so anyway, welcome to Baltimore. For those of you who are here for the first time, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, my name's Paul Driscoll. Um, I'm not a local, I'm from England. Um, I first came to Baltimore for the 2001 clan gathering and fell in love with the place and have been coming back um, ever since really. And then I was fortunate enough to meet my wife Donna, who's the daughter of Patrick and Bernie, whose home this is. So that, that's my story. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Baltimore. Um, we'll go into a bit of the, the history of the place. And obviously we'll talk a lot about doing the Shade Castle and then the old Driscolls obviously. Um, we'll talk a bit about the fishing industry and we'll talk about the um, sack of Baltimore, the Algerian pirate raid. So Baltimore today, um, we were pop um, a permanent population of about 350 people. Um, about 70% of the homes in Baltimore are actually holiday homes or second homes. So in the summer months, that population swells to about three and a half thousand. So um, July and August, you know, the, the place is absolutely manic, really. Um, you know, it's, um, we have trouble with car parking spaces, for example. You know, it's, um, you know, we've got car parking space. Uh, by the, the pier, um, but you know, the, the islanders keep their cars in there, for example, you know, so that's full all year round, so the, the tourists come, you know, it's uh, cars parked all over the place, you know. Um, so that's, that's who we are. Um, obviously, um, the tourism is a, is a big part of the, the local economy, um, but apart from tourism, we're a, a proper working village, an all round village, obviously, the ferries service the islands. Um, every day of the year, I think back from Christmas Day, uh, we've got a healthy fishing fleet um, and, and, and working out of Baltimore. Uh, and then people have just got the normal jobs. Like my wife, for an example, she's a solicitor. You know, um, before I finished last year, I was a network design engineer. So we've got all kinds of people in the village, uh, proper functioning village. So um, the name Baltimore, there's um, two trains of thought where the name Baltimore comes from. And I'll forgive and I'll ask forgiveness from all your locals about my Irish pronunciation. But um, one theory is Valyong Timor, town of the big house, and the big house being Dunne Shade Castle. Or the other theory is uh, Baltimore, and the great reputation of Bala would have been a, a pagan god. Um, there is evidence that Baltimore were at the site of her, the pagan worship uh, back in the day. So, we'll start with a brief history lesson. So, uh, humans <laughs> first come into Ireland about 8,000 BC after the last great ice age, and they would come from like either the land bridge that connected Ireland with, with Scotland at the time, or maybe a short boat crossing. But when early humans come into an island, Ireland's a very forested country, okay? So navigation's very difficult. So most of those early humans, they settled by the water. You know, navigation is easy on the water, be that the sea or rivers. Now, back then, uh, sea levels would have been about a book, two, three, maybe even five metres lower than they are today. So a lot of the archaeology associated with these early peoples has been lost. The water levels rise, these people are set by the water, so that's gone. So we really start to see um, archaeology, um, uh, historical evidence, uh, human habitation in Ireland, really about 4000 BC when farming comes into Ireland and people settle permanent populations. So um, passage tombs, for example. So the earliest archaeology we've got in this area really would be um, out by the causeway that links um, 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 Ra, which is an area of land between Skibbery and Baltimore, with Ringaroga Island. And there's a passage tomb there that dates from about 3,500 BC, and, but that's only visible uh, to low tide. Again, because of rising water levels, that would have been on dry land when it was first built, but now um, it's, it's covered by water at high tide. So that's the earliest archaeology we've got, 3,500 um, 3, BC. Um, the next bit of archaeology we've got supposes out on Cape Clear. Um, a lot of you have seen the marriage stones out there, it's a pair of standing stones. One has a hole cut in it, so it's believed that um, during pagan times, um, bride and groom would maybe put their hands through a down with some kind of cloth to signify the marriage. And that dates from about 1000 BC. And then near to the lifeboat station, we've got a ring fort. Now, this is a bit of an enigma. Um, not many people knew it were there. It's been covered by bracken and undergrowth for, for a long, long time now. Uh, but last year, um, a group of volunteers um, cleared it, made it accessible. Um, so that's a ring fort. So what a typical ring fort in Ireland would date to the 5th and 9th centuries AD. Um, basically they're in, um, in close farmsteads, um, which typically has a circular um, dwelling 
um, house in the middle, associated farm buildings, and it's surrounded by an earthen bank, topped by a palisade, a wooden fence if you like, and surrounded by a ditch. So we tidied it all up, we formed a committee to look after it, and um, last year during Heritage Week, which is in August every year, we had an archaeologist come and give a talk about ring forts. Um, so we're really excited about this. And then he opened his, um, his spiel with, um, I'm here to talk about ring forts, but I don't think this is a ring fort. And we thought, oh God, what have we actually <coughs> spent all this time uncovering, you know? Is, is it something just from the last century, um, you know, a farm used for keeping pigs, for example? So we thought, oh God. So anyway, he did his, his spiel. But anyway, as he finished off, he said he doesn't think it's a, uh, a typical ring fort. He thinks it could be something much older. Um, in, in size, it's comparable to um, a Bronze Age fort up near Ulian Hall. And, and that particular one, they did some carbon dating and found new material from carbon date. And that dates from about 2000 BC. So maybe that's what we've got here, but we don't know. We're actually, we've got some people coming to do a geophysical survey starting on Monday. Uh, so they're going to map it out and see if they can figure out how old it is, so maybe next year we, we might progress to doing a dig and see if we can find some different carbon dates. So that's the kind of the, the oldest archaeology we've got in the area, um, and then it comes to doing the shade, I suppose, so we'll talk about that. So I'm just trying to work out where to do it. So normally I talk about that in the Castle Horn, and then we walk down to the green, and then we talk about doing the shade. So I think I'm on track here. <laughs> and the one thing I always do, we, we'll talk about the fishing industry later, but on the way down to the green to talk about doing the shade, I just point out the, the pier structure um, uh, down below. So um, in front of bushes, there's some steps that goes down to a car park and you've got the, the sailing club there. Um, that tall reclaimed land, the water would have um, um, come up to the bottom of those steps historically. And where the sailing club is, that's on, um, built on the original pier um, that were built in 1838. So that's the original pier structure. And the, the ferry pier that goes out to the islands that was built in 1883, and the Northern Pier here, that was built in 1907, but we'll talk about the fishing industry, I'll explain how, how they evolved over time. So yeah, so let's talk about Dunashade Castle. So the background to Dunashade, the Dunashade were actually built by the Anglo-Normans. Um, so, and the, the background to the Anglo-Norman invasion into to Ireland, and I have to like, defend the country of Earthly because people say they, the English come in and the English did that, and the English did that. Let's face it, the Anglo Normans were French Vikings. So, <laughs> you know, we have beef with the English, rather than the French Vikings, you know, they're the real troublemakers. <laughs> so, the background to the Anglo Norman invasion um, so basically, in 1155, King Henry II um, of England, he's um, awarded a papal bull, a papal license, if you, if you like, by Pope Adrian IV to allow him to, to invade Ireland. Why would he want to invade Ireland? Well, under the feudal system, you know, um, Henry II, you know, he rules England and, and part of that kingdom to in France as well, but he's got very ambitious barons and knights underneath him, you know, um, all land hungry or power hungry, you know, so he thinks, you know, if I can get him into to Ireland, you know, they can go and have out their own land and, you know, they can be busy over there and he keeps my, my throne secure. So he has that um, granted 1155, but he doesn't act upon it um, until um, 1169 when the first wave of invasion is. Um, Pope Adrian IV, I mean, his reason for um, a granting a papal bull is because Ireland never comes under um, uh, the realm of the Roman Empire. Um, the, the, Rome, the church in Rome has not got control over the church in Ireland. The church in Ireland is fiercely independent. And Adrian IV doesn't like that, you know, he wants to bring the Irish church under the, his control. So that, you know, he's got his own selfish reasons for granting Henry II a license um, to come into Ireland. So he doesn't act upon it right until 1169, and the background to the invasion is um, Dermot McMorrow, who's the King of Leinster over in the southeast of the country, not a particularly nice fella. Um, a, a feature of life in Ireland at that time would be very warlike, the, the clans, the different kingdoms would have been continually fighting each other. Um, but um, Dermot McMorrow, he, he does enough um, nasty deeds, if you like, to actually unite all the other high kings against him. So they unite. They make a bid to, to capture and kill him, and he has to flee for his life. So he gets out of Ireland just in time. Makes his way to England, finds his way to, to France, where Henry II holds his, his court, and he pleads for assistance. So look, you know, if you help me get my lands back, I'll recognise you as king, as sire, and um, Henry II likes the, the sound of that. So he says, yeah, make your way back to England, you know, with my blessing, raise an army, and, you know, we'll help you get your lands back. So he finds his way back into England, into Wales, 
And uh, he petitioned Strongbow, Richard de Clare, to help him raise an army to come into Ireland to, to get his lands back. So there's really three waves of invasion then. 1169 is led by a guy called Robert Fitzstephen. Um, Strongbow, Richard de Clare himself, comes in 1170. And then Henry II comes in 1171. Henry II said, okay, I've got everybody over there, but I need to make sure they're behaving themselves and they're not getting too ambitious and they're going to come back this way and take my throne. So this first wave of invasion, Robert Fitzstephen, he comes over 1169, as I say, he spends about seven or eight years um, fighting in the east of the country. And eventually in 1177, he, he makes a, a break out and he starts heading down to what he's caught. Now there's a, um, a, an English intelligence report, if you like, describing um, Robert Fitzstephen um, about, about this time. And it describes him as degenerated into mere Irish. Um, <laughs> you, might have heard the, yeah, you, might, you might have heard the phrase that a lot of the Anglo Normans became more Irish than the Irish. Uh, Robert Fitzstephen is a classic example. He started dressing like the Irish, he's riding his horse like the Irish, and he's, he's called himself McSlaney at this point. So McSlaney is just the Irish version of Fitzstephen. But it's his descendants that actually built Dunshade Castle. So um, it's written in the Annals of Inish Fallon um, that McSlaney um, builds Dunshade Castle in 1215 and Dunanau, um, a, a castle over on Ringarogra Island, the forest, which is no longer standing in, in 1215. Um, Dunanau meaning uh, fought the foreigners or strangers, Dunashade meaning fought the jewels. Why fought the jewels? Well, the castle's built out of the red sandstone bedrock that it sits on. And when it's freshly cut, it exposes quartz or Kerry diamonds, and that would have really glistened in the sun. So that's how we think that doing the shade gets its name. So when the Anglo Normans get into this part of the world, we think it's a peaceful incursion into West Cork. There have been lots of fighting, the first the waves of Norman invasion in the east of the country when they get here. We think it's a peaceful incursion. Um, on, on a couple of accounts, we might have a peaceful. First of all, when the West Cork, uh, when the Anglo Normans come into West Cork, they build castles all over the place. You can't build castles while you're fighting. You know, it's, um, you, just, you just can't do it. Um, secondly, and I'll keep my voice down now because I don't want to upset my in-laws. <laughs> listening. Uh, we know that the two branches of the McCarthy family were fighting at that time. And it's written in the annals that the Anglo-Normans were assisting on both sides, play, basically playing the McCarthys off against each other. So the McCarthys are too busy fighting each other. They're not looking at the horizon and the Anglo-Normans coming over it. And also, uh, one of the first slaves into this area, he marries the daughter of the local McCarthy chieftain. So all these um, events tell us that were peaceful incursion into West Cork. So we believe the Anglo-Normans and the Irish clans were kind of living peacefully side by side for a period of 40 or 50 years. Um, you know, some historians will say that the Irish clans and the Anglo-Normans, there, there were no interaction between them, the Irish clans did their business that, and that, that's absolute rubbish, you know, we know they were intermarriage, you know. Well, it's true that the, the Irish clans would have gone about ways as they always done for centuries, there was certainly interaction with, between the two. So in this part of the world, the Irish clans, the anglo Normans were peacefully side by side, as I said, for about 40, 50 years, until the McCarthys started brewing up trouble. One of the McCarthy clan is killed by an anglo Norman. it sends the McCarthys into rebellion. So the McCarthys, assisted by the local clans, that would be the O'Driscolls here, and the O'Marnies, on Mizzen, the O'Sullivans, uh, Donahue's Donovans, Again, traditionally, these clans would have been fighting each other on and off. On this occasion, they unite forces and they defeat the Anglo-Normans at the Battle of Callan in 1261, which is up near Kenmare. And um, it's written in the annals that the foreigners, Anglo-Normans, are dispossessed of their castles at this time. So we think the O'Driscolls probably, they, they came in here at that time. And there's certainly no more mention of any Slaney's or McSlaney's in, in the annals, so we, we, we think, you know, they're, they're out of the area. So, um, so, yeah, so the Driscolls take hold, and then this becomes their um, primary headquarters, if you like, the chieftain's residence for the next 400 years or so. And they have a fine life for themselves then. You know, the O'Driscolls then, they don't answer to anybody. The O'Driscolls are set up like a city state. Um, they have to pay a chief rent to the, the McCarthy's or the dominant clan, but apart from that, they answer to, to nobody. Okay. Um, so, let's talk about the O'Driscolls. Who are they? The O'Driscolls. <coughs> would have been the principal family of the Corkali. The Corkali was a tribal group in whose territory extended from um, Kinsale up near Cork right down to Kenmare and Kerry, where it was a huge tract of land that they, they had. Now, over the centuries, um, prior to Norman invasion, that land it, it decreased and it got encroached upon by the Oinocta. The Oinocta were a tribal group who were based up near Cashel, uh, 
the east, north and east. Um, they only knock to, um, over centuries they spread further south and they only knock to gain rights to families like the McCarthy's and the old Martinets, you know, so the old Bristol's way before any of them, you know, this was this part of our kind of land. So um, that kind of, it got contracted, the land, and again, after Anglo-Norman invasion, that, that territory um, uh, contracted it yet again. So the old Bristol's basically, by the time they take possession of Doonashade Castle, their lands are Baltimore, Shirkin, Cape Clear Island, um, land extended up to Upper Down, which is the north side of the Island River, and Castle Haven, and which is modern day Castle Townsend, that was their territory. Okay, and so the old Driscolls really, the, the Irish clans historically, their, their wealth would have been uh, measured in cattle. Um, once they, the old Driscolls were, were pushed down to this part of the world, the land here wouldn't have been suitable really for grazing, so they had to turn to the sea for a living, and God, what a job they made of it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, there's no doubt the old Driscolls were the most power, powerful maritime clan Ireland's ever seen, you know. Um, so they got very rich, very powerful. They, they got rich through a variety of means, first through legitimate trade, if you like. Um, back in, in medieval Europe, um, Ireland's um, exports would have chiefly been hides, um, wool, salted fish. So the old Driscolls would have controlled that commerce. Okay, um, so everything going out and in would have been taxed by the old Driscolls. They'd have got first refusal on everything. So that's what we're chiefly exporting. Uh, the import were wine, things were mainly paid for in wine, and the old Driscolls love their wine. I'm going to talk about that in a short while. And um, uh, the fishing industry, of course, the old Driscolls got rich off, uh, off the fishing industry. Great fishing waters here. Uh, the old Driscolls would have fished themselves, but anybody who coming to fish in these waters. Um, would have had to get a license from the old Driscolls to do so, and the old Driscolls would have then um, taxed them or made them pay to dry the nets, land the catch, salt the catch, so they got um, rich off of this activity. And lastly, um, piratical activities. You know, the old Driscolls were a piratical clan, there's no doubt about it. Um, back at, at the time, um, Cape Clear would have been used as a marker. Any shipping coming up from the south, from Spain and Portugal, would have used Cape Clear as a marker before turning east, or eastern ports, or going on to England. Once you're in these waters, you are fair game for the old Bristols, you know? They would have gone out, um, they would have um, charged almost like a black rent, really, you know? Um, we'll attack your, your ship, we'll, we'll, we'll take your load unless you pay us some money, or they would have just attacked it, you know, simple, simple as that. <laughs> and, and all this activity really brings them into conflict with the city of Waterford. Now, Waterford um, would have been a, a Viking city. Um, one of the earliest analytic references to the old Driscolls is attacking Waterford, and this is you know way before the Anglo Normans come in, you know. So even then, they must have had a formidable fleet to be able to go up and attack Waterford. But certainly, um, after they take possession of Doom the Shade, there's lots of instances of the old Driscolls attacking Waterford, and vice versa, you know, the, the guys from Waterford coming down here. But one thing I, sh I should mention actually before I go on, because this is me walking around, I'll be able to work out what I've missed by <laughs> Um, with the old Driscolls, I mentioned that they were the principal family of the Cork Lee. Um, one of the, the principal guys, or um, a well-known member of the Cork Lee, would have been St. Kieran, or St. Kieran, who came from Cape Clear. So he was born in 353 AD, and he was uh, described as a very spiritual person. He'd been a pagan, uh, but a very spiritual person. And he went off to Europe in, in search of greater spirituality. And um, while in Europe, he finds his way to Rome, and he actually converts, and he becomes a Christian. And he comes back to Ireland about 402 AD as a bishop. And he would think he's one of the first bishops to actually come into Ireland. Okay, and so he actually predates St. Patrick uh, by about 20 years. And then um, it's written in the annals that St. Kieran and St. Kieran, um, he converted the chiefs of his mother's tribe um, to become Christians, to believe in the cross. So if we think the old Driscolls, they would have been one of the first clans to, to actually um, convert to Christianity. Um, then. So um, going back to the um, old Driscolls and the piratical activity. Um, so I've written in the annals, uh, every reference to the old Driscolls, excuse me. Oh, that's my cousin Finn, a lot of you all know him. <laughs> he always picks the most inopportune <laughs> We were at, um, a few years ago, um, a lot of you might know that we have a fiddle fair here in Maine and um, one Sunday afternoon we were up at the big marquee up at Cases where it used to be and it was some lovely melancholy music, it was just lovely and uh, I sat with um, John, your cousin John and Dave and uh, really enjoying it and Declan is pushing through everybody trying to get to the front and it really spoiling the atmosphere like, what's Declan up to? And he came right to the front where I went, Paul, 
somebody outside insisting on seeing me, I thought, oh God, no. So I had to get up and squeeze it for everybody, apologise, and sure enough it was Finn, like, you know. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I thought that. Uh, move on. Oh yeah, so um, all the uh, analytic references to the old Driscoll's, it, it's all about um, um, either warfare or attacks at, at, at sea. Um, as I, I mentioned, the uh, Driscoll's would have um, teamed up with the McCarthy's to defeat the Anglo-Normans in the Battle of Calhoun 1261. And it's only a few years after that, during the annals, that the McCarthy's and the old Driscoll's were at war at sea. Um, in, in the annals, it says it was the greatest battle that Ireland had ever seen. And um, it was only night that parted them after many had died. So it doesn't say who actually won, but I think it's saying the old Driscoll's probably won. <laughs> <there. laughs> Yeah. So yeah, so going back to the trading activities, as I said, the chief imports for wine, the old Driscoll's were mainly dealing with Spain, Portugal and France. So um, in the 13th century, um, there's uh, the story that the chief at the time would have been a Donnacher or Driscoll, he took his shipment of wine from Gascony um, in France, but he had no means to pay for it. So he gave his son a security. So his son went onto the French ship, went back to, to Gascony, and he spent quite a few years down there before the old Driscolls eventually paid for the wine that they could deliver it off. So when he came back, he was actually known as Angas the, the, the Gascon for the rest of his life, and the stretch of water between Shirkin Island and Cape Clear is known as Gascon and Sound after them as well. So we, we, we know they were dealing in, in, with wine. Um, so as I said, the conflict with Waterford um, really makes up a lot of the stories and the analytic references. Um, if you've ever gone up to Waterford, they've got a great uh, medieval museum in the centre of the town. And um, I went up there sometime last year, and I was looking all over, there was no mention of the old Driscoll's at all. <laughs> so I well, was quite disappointed. But anyway, eventually I went to, there's an audio-visual display up there. And um, it's going through the history of the town, and then it says on the 4th of September, 1386, the old Driscolls came up to Baltimore, like, yes! <laughs> there we go, and other people are kind of looking and thinking, what is this, not a cheer in the <laughs> But the old Driscolls, they, um, they formed an alliance with the Powers family up in Waterford. So um, Waterford City would have been full of English uh, people, English merchants. Uh, the Powers family would have uh, lived in Waterford County, not, not in Waterford City, but they are no love for Waterford City. So when the Driscolls went up there, they generally teamed up with the, the, the powers and they made attack Waterford, like, you know. So uh, 4th of September 1386, they attacked it, was successful attacked by the old Driscolls. There were many English merchants dead there. So again, you can only imagine what kind of a fleet the old Driscolls possessed at that time to actually go up there and mount a successful raid, because there's actually a model in the museum, there's a model of Waterford as how it would have been at the time. And it's a proper walled city, like, you know, formidable defences. So, uh, the old Driscolls obviously had enough military force to be able to mount attack on a, a city like that, you know. So, um, carrying on with the feud um, between the old Driscolls and Waterford. Uh, Christmas Day, 1413, quite a famous incident. Uh, the mayor of Waterford at the time, one guy called Simon Wickham, he sailed into Baltimore Harbour on Christmas Day, 1413, uh, with a group of men. And he came up to the, the castle here and he convinced the porter to, to let him. So the old Driscoll for Christmas Day, the chieftain and his family, they would have been sat exactly where you are now. They'd been partying on the Christmas dinner. And so when the men from Waterford came in through the door up in the corner there, that would have been the main entrance to the castle at, at that time. Uh, the old Driscolls were alarmed and the men from Waterford said, look, you know, I know we've had our troubles in the past, but this is Christmas Day. We've come with a gift of wine. We know your old Driscolls like a bit of wine, you know, so we've come in. Don't be alarmed, you know, let, let's be friends and let's enjoy Christmas Day together. But then as soon as the old Driscolls got to dance with the men from Waterford, the old Driscolls were trapped in Ireland and taken up to Waterford. And they eventually made it back, they were ransomed, they, they came back. But where this is significant, um, people tell us that this is the first recorded evidence of people dancing in Ireland. Now, people would have danced before that, but it's not actually physically recorded. Why is it not recorded? It's probably because it was viewed as immoral by the church, you know, so it's very significant. So um, we know Christmas Day 413, people are um, throwing some shapes in here, you know. So, uh, so really, the, the, I suppose, um, when the old Driscolls kind of deceased, uh, stopped their piratical activities, but again, it was another incident with, with Waterford, and this is 1537. So the old Driscoll chieftain at the time, um, a Finneen, um, all the old, most of the old Driscoll chieftains were Finneens, you know, you just have to remember which one. It's, uh, I noticed if, it, like on Wikipedia, if you look there, Finneen or Driscoll, you look, and whoever's composed it has pulled all these stories together over different Finneens. So if, it, if you read that as accurate, you think Finneen's about 500 years old. <laughs> 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 
Um, but so this would mean at the, the, the time, and these, um, it's so they're up where the beacon is now, and they observed three Portuguese ships sheltering from the storm. So as the old Driscoll did, they, they rolled out and offered them um, 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 safe anchorage in the harbour and guide them in. Again, with, with the, um, this coastline and with this harbour in particular, what's an asset to the old Driscolls is it's very difficult to get in and out of um, unless you know the water. So obviously, it's different today with GPS and, and all that lot. But you know, especially at low tide, there's a lot of rocks just under the surface of the water, both to the south and the north, again, entrance. And again, I suppose if you're out at sea, looking in without the beacon there, it would be very hard to detect, you know, what, how do you actually get into to, to Baltimore. So, um, the chieftain, uh, his son, and his men guided the Portuguese ships in and said, look, we'll just take, I think, three or four pipes of wine for the struggle. Once we're in here, the old Driscolls took the lot, you know. <laughs> they, uh, the Portuguese men were clapped in, clapped in irons and, um, the, the old Driscolls helped themselves to the wine and that were distributed amongst the white clan and uh, the followers. So, you know, I suppose a week or so later, the guys from Waterford thinking, hang on, our wine's not turned up, I wonder where it is, you know. <laughs> so, uh, let's go find it. So, they put, um, sent an ex um, expedition down here, came into the harbour, and lo and behold, they've got three Portuguese ships there and there's no wine left, you know. <laughs> so, um, they fired a few shots. Um, at the old Driscoll castles, doing the long and, and doing the shade here. Um, so probably the old Driscolls were one of the first clans ever to come under direct artillery fire. And uh, they went on the merry way, but they, they weren't done then. So um, a month or so later, they came back, the Mecklenburg, but with a really sizable force this time. And uh, they really set about the old Driscolls. They uh, started on Shirking, where they'd attacked uh, doing the long and um, the, the Abbey there and the Shirkin at that time would have been a collection of, of villages so they went from village to village. From there they moved to Spanish Island um, just to the, the northwest of us here where there was another old Driscoll castle and they attacked that and then they came into Baltimore itself and um, they attacked Baltimore. Now um, certainly didn't diminish the old Driscoll clan as a, as a, um, a power, as a, as a force, but actually the English audit done a clan and the Irish clans and their military strength of the latter part of the 16th century. And at that time, the old Driscolls are described as having a chief galley of 30 oars and between 60 and 80 other boats. So there was still uh, a very strong military force. But it did seem to put an end to their piratical activities, certainly targeting English shipping. I think they learned the lesson um, at that point there. And it's also during the, the 16th century, really, that the Anglicisation of Ireland, I suppose, begins. Um, first under Henry VIII and then his daughter Elizabeth I. Henry VIII, as you'll all know, abolished the Catholic Church in, um, in England. And obviously, religion uh, played a major part in politics in, in Europe at that time. And so by doing that, he actually makes an enemy of, of, of Catholic Spain, obviously. Irish people here are still Catholic. So basically what, what starts is that the English start um, um, allocating big swathes of land, big um, estates if you like, to um, uh, notable English people, um, titled people. And then the early part of the, the next century, um, 17th century after the Battle of Kinsale, you've got the plantation of Ireland with, with what you describe as English Protestant working class people, and that's where that starts. So the you Driscolls know, at this time, um, a lot of the Irish um, clans who didn't submit to English rule were ruthlessly um, wiped out, attacked, you know. So the old Driscolls, um, um, quite rightly, um, they submitted to the English crown. So uh, a process, a project, if you like, called um, Submit and Read Grant. So feeding a Driscoll, um, the, the chieftain at the time, he uh, went to London. He submitted his lands um, to Queen Elizabeth I. And she, he was then re-granted them back and he was given an English title. So he became a Sabini in Driscoll. And this was the English uh, attempt to try and anglicise the, the, the country as a whole. So the English would have been loyal to the Crown um, right up until the Battle of Kinsale um, in 1601, which is a, a major turning point in, in Irish history and Irish Anglo relations, I suppose. So the, the background to the Battle of Kinsale um, the, the northern chieftains, Reg Hugh O'Donnell and Hugh O'Neill, they're in rebellion up in the north. They've had enough of English encroachment on their lands. Okay. And they petition um, King Philip of Spain to, to send help, and eventually he does, um, in the form of a wee armada. Now, from a military point of view, this is a tactical cock-up from start to finish. You know, the Irish armies are way up in the north, the Spanish land at Kinsale. They could not have been further away if they tried. Okay, so it's going to take the Irish armies another two or three months to actually march down and meet up with the, the Spanish at Kinsale. While the Spanish are there, they kind of um, hold up there under siege. The English are surrounding Kinsale. 
Now, where, where this is significant for the old Bristol is, um, shipping um, reinforcements found for Kinsale from Spain um, and bad weather is forced into Old Bristol territory, into Castle Haven, to Mid Pacific. Uh, from Castle Haven, they, they come in here. Now, the Old Bristols immediately sense the tide is turning, if you like, and think, okay, we've been loyal to, to England, but we had to be, you know, we really did. There's lots of evidence of um, Queen Elizabeth I being petitioned by people in England to set up a, a colony in Baltimore, a very important um, uh, port, um, great fishing, as I've already mentioned. Uh, you've got all medieval maps in Baltimore was mentioned on there, you know, very, very significant. So the O'Driscolls had to submit to um, main, um, ensure they maintained onto to their historic lands. But however, um, when the Spanish come in here, they think, hang on, which way do we go? Let's go with the Spanish and we can get with the English forever. So, so Finin, he lets the Spanish garrison troops in here. Um, and then along on um, Shirkin Island and at, at Castle Haven, and it said that um, the chieftain, Finneen, he moves to one of his castles inland, so that could have been up at Old Court, it could have been Loch Hyde, we're not sure, but he moves inland and it leaves the Spanish in here. Not only that, does the old Driscolls let the, the Spanish use their castles, um, the chieftain's sons, they actually join forces with the Spanish, and they, they, um, they're quite rebellious and they say, okay, let's, uh, let's get the English out of here once and for, for all. So. As I said, the Northern Armies, it took them two or three months to get down to Kinsale, and they eventually did. Um, everybody agrees, all historians and, and historians, academics will agree, it should have been an Irish-Spanish victory. Um, the English commander on the day, um, I think a guy called Mount Joy, when he saw the mass forces against him, he said the day is lost. You know, it, there's no way they were going to win this. And when I said the English as well, I have to be clear, it wasn't um, as simple as English against Spanish and Irish. There were some Irish fighting on the, the English side as well. So the morning of the battle, um, the Spanish commander in Kinsella is a guy called Aguila, a tactical genius, and he fought all over Europe very successfully. He was a fantastic um, guy. And so he tells um, Hugh O'Neill, um, take that hill, look down on the English, I'll do the rest. That's all I want you to do, okay? So O'Neill does. Uh, Reggie O'Donnell, it's a foggy morning, he gets lost in the fog, so he doesn't actually make his rendezvous. Um, but nonetheless, O'Neill takes the hill, looks down on the English. So the English should have been wiped out at that point. But for whatever reason, and the history doesn't record, O'Neill doesn't like where he is at the top of this hill and retreats. And the English can't believe their luck. So I'm thinking we're doomed. Not only does O'Neill retreat, the English ride up and take the hill themselves. And once they're on top of the hill, they catch the Irish in the autumn and flee. Now, Irish um, um, tactical victories always come in kind of guerrilla warfare you know, attacking from the trees, the forests, you know, where the English, they're like a, a level playing field, if you like, you know, like that. So the English can't believe the luck, they've actually caught the fleeing Irish in, a, in the open, and it's a field day for the Irish cavalry, they go down, sorry, the English cavalry, into a bit of a slaughter. Some historians say the big difference, well, actually, the two cavalries on the day, is just the fact that the English used stirrups, so they could take the, the, uh, the force of a, a lance charge, you know, where the Irish kind of walk, um, rode their back and, and they'd be kind of, kind of spears, javelins, if you like, overarm, you know, and you put two forces like that against each other, the guys with the stirrups and the lances are going to win every day. But anyway, England wins the day. So what this means for the O'Driscolls is after the English are victorious, they sail into here to take the surrender of the Spanish who are garrisoned here. So the Spanish surrender, and over the O'Driscoll castles to the English, and then they're allowed to go back to Spain. No bother. Um, the chieftain's sons who fought, now they're wanted men, so they have to get the hell out of here. Um, one of them, I think it's Connor, and he holds that for a couple of years. He actually is old up in Kilcore Castle, which is Jeremy Irons' place, just around the, the, the coast here. He holds up there until 1603, uh, before he, he's, um, he manages to escape. He's surrounded by the English, but he gets away. So the, the chieftain, Sabini, he's left here on his own. His sons have, and their families have gone to Spain. And you'll have heard of the plight of the Earls that, the Earls that after a few years after O'Neill, O'Donnell, etc., all the, the Irish Earls um, disappear. And it leaves a bit of a power vacuum that is actually filled by the English and the, the Protestant planters who will come in. So, after the uh, Battle of Kinsale, Sophini in here, he's left to face the music of the English. So, he pleads his innocence. He says, I really didn't want to help the English, but I were overruled by my sons. And he seems to have been believed. We do know that he encouraged favour. 
Um, just down at the bottom of the east wall here, there's a, there's a well, and we know for a fact there's lots of communications between the English and the court of Elizabeth I. They they describing him as a, an old man who will rule by his sons and his shown as um, great favour, great hospitality. And we know that he emptied his well of wine, uh, sorry, of water, and filled it with silver and wine, and let the English out themselves. You know, he's really trying to keep the English happy and you know plead his case. So basically, it takes a few years, but he does get pardoned eventually. Um, he does get his castles and his lands back, but by this time the plantation of Ireland has um, started, and Baltimore's no exception. So you have English planters here, and they set in the cold area over there, and they now con um, control all the commerce in and out of the, the harbour, um, all the fishing. So, so Finina has lost all his sources of revenue, so he's penniless. So what he does to try and raise money is that he enters into um, land deals, leasing deals with a, a couple of people. So Walter Coppinger, who's um, a, a lawyer from Cork City, and Sir Thomas Crook, who's the English planter overseeing the plantation of, of Baltimore. Um, these deals are very confusing, and they actually contradict each other. You can't see who's leasing land to who or anything. Well, but to cut a long story short, it all comes dead in a court case in 1629. Uh, when Sir Finine is um, told to pay back about £2,000 that he's borrowed. Um, he can't, he's penniless, so he loses everything officially at that point, and so all proper duty takes control of everything there. So, uh, so that really ends the, um, the old Driscolls as the, 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 the powerful force in, in this area, I suppose. Um, but that were happening not just to the old Driscolls, it was that up to all the Irish clans around that time. Um, still the, the major surname in the area, and um, I know a lot of you already know the phrase, but the saying in, in Baltimore is, if you're not an old Driscoll, you're probably sleeping with one, which is, uh, <laughs> which is just about right. The old Driscolls do make a um, uh, sense. So in 1625, there's um, a kind of audit done of Baltimore, and it's recorded as being an English town. There's no Irish living here. The old Driscolls who are still here have not gone to Spain. They're living in the countryside, and they still have a good presence out in Shirkin and, and, and Cape. There is a, a nationwide rebellion in 1641, um, it's a bit of a slow burner, um, but eventually it, it, it um, works its way down to the old Driscolls here and they start attacking the English housing. Um, by this time we've already had the um, sack of Baltimore, which we'll talk about in a minute, so there's not too many people here, but the English who are left, the old Driscolls attack their housing and the old Driscolls, uh, so the English who are left actually seek refuge in here and the old Driscolls make um, a, an attempt to to, to get in, but it's, it's repulsed, but that really ends the old Driscoll's there as a, um, a military force, I suppose, around that time. So the last people to actually be in here would have been Cromwellian troops in 1649. When they leave, we, we've no record of anyone living in after that date. So we think the, the Cromwellian troops um, employing a scorched earth policy, as they did all over Ireland, they might have set fire to the place, but we don't know. This place is actually up for auction in Dublin in 1703, and the lands. So it describes the lands, and doing the shade is just described as the ruin of a very old castle. So we know by that time, 1703, it was just four walls. And it stayed that way right up until 1997, uh, when Patrick and Bernie, my mother and father-in-law, bought it as a ruin. They spent uh, the next eight years renovating it, and they moved in in 2005, and it's been their home ever since. So that's, that's the story. The, what, and what, Dunashade is, it's an example of a Norman, I'm going to say the word, I'll spell it out, H-A-L-L, -L, Hall House, and why I do that, especially American school, and I actually, a couple of times I've said it's a Norman Hall House, and they thought I said a Norman Hall House, and then, <laughs> to fix the giggles, and I just couldn't understand what they were laughing at, so Norman Hall House. A lot of the Anglo-Normans who come into Ireland, 1169, 1771, um, come from southwest England and Wales. There's lots of examples of this type of building in South West England and in, in Wales. So um, it's called the Shade or Baltimore Castle, but it would have really been its main purpose would have been a kind of manor house, you know, and that's what it would have been. So historically, then the, the ground floor would have been um, stores, goods, no one would have lived there today. Patrick and Bernie got the bedrooms and bathrooms there. This has been created exactly as it, it would have been, the, the walls were in really good order. Um, so um, we know exactly where the galleries were fireplaces, you know, everything that it would have been. So the chief and his family would have lived in that part, that was the sole house, that would have probably been wooded off, and that would have been a living quarters. And then the, the hall here would have been used 
for um, all the other festivals, um, feasting, partying if you like, plotting, you know, that would have all happened in here. Very important for a, a clan chieftain to display his wealth um, and, um, and provide great hospitality to, to visit you know, other clan chieftains, I suppose, and, and visiting um, and ships while they did all the negotiation and the businesses. So that brings you up to date there. So um, we'll talk a bit now about the 